All right, hey guys, what's going on? So we are now moving on to a new playlist. This new playlist, you guys have spoken, is on differential geometry. Differential geometry is a huge, huge field of mathematics. And I think going into this area of mathematics is gonna help us for later content that is to come, which is content in general relativity and topology and so much more. But anyways, without me, rambling on how great this is. Let's get right into the content. All right, so we are going to be talking about, for the next few weeks or so, differential geometry, and I'm also telling you guys that I'm going to be ramping up other types of playlists and other pieces of uh, content as we progress on with the expansion of this video, or this channel. And today we're going to be talking about Euclidean versus non-Euclidean geometries this is going to be a simple introduction. There's going to be no exclusive content on this video. Just want, I just want you to guys want you guys to sit back, relax, and let's explore exactly what it means for geometry to be Euclidean or non-Euclidean. Okay, so what is the Euclidean? Euclidean, simply put, means that all the internal angles, we can think of all the internal angles in some triangles as summing up to 180. Okay, that's really the bare bones of what we want to consider as being called Euclidean or a flat space. You have a piece of paper, when you draw a triangle on that piece of paper, all the internal angles on that triangle have to add up to 180. Okay, what we want to do, the theme for the first few videos in differential geometry is going to be what exactly, uh, how exactly do we deviate from that internal angle summation, okay? And in the first case, we're just going to consider spherical geometry, right? So in the case of uh, spherical geometry, this is case one here, we can already see that the angles, the internal angles on any triangle that you draw on a sphere are going to be greater than 180 because you can take two parallel lines that are perpendicular to the equator on a sphere, okay, and automatically these are already 190 degrees or 90 degrees and 90 degrees. Those add up to 180, but parallel lines on a sphere meet at some point, and so and that point is going to be in this case the pole. And we can already see if these already add up to 180, then we're going to have some deficit angle or some angle that uh, deviates from flat space, right? So this is the angle that's, uh, this is the degree of the angle or the degree of the internal angles within a triangle that tells us how much we're deviating from flat space, right? So in spherical space or spherical geometry, uh, the deficit angle epsilon is equal to the angle sum of the internal triangle, th this triangle right here, minus one, a pi, because in radians, pi corresponds to 180 degrees. Okay, and so uh, this is all in radians, right? So this this is going to give us the change in that angle uh, if we if it was just pi, because pi again is 180, that's flat space. This here's flat space. This here is takes into account the change when we're going into spherical geometry. With this, if the sphere of the hemisphere is given by this simple equation, which you've probably seen in a general uh, geometry class, and the angle occupies a fraction of the area in that northern hemisphere, here's that northern hemisphere again, well, we can say that the area, therefore, is 2 pi r, right, because we're just dealing with the northern hemisphere, times this factor here. And whatever epsilon is, if it's small, the fact that fraction is going to be small, and you know, that sort of corresponds to a, a smaller angle up here, right? So you can think of the angle as closing in on itself. Okay. And... So we multiply all this together, we get epsilon r squared, right? Because these two guys will cancel out. And we get the deficit angle as a function 
of the area um, and the radius of the sphere. So this is a, and this, what's going to be interesting is that this is going to be considered a general formula for the deficit angle, even when we're not talking about spheres, okay? And we'll see why later. This is a, this is a very brief, very soft introduction into this topic. All right. So let's talk about case two, uh, hyperbolic geometry. So. In the case of hyperbolic geometry, all the angles in this hyperbola, or this saddle, if you will, this is a, a hyperbola in three-dimensional space, essentially, all of the angles, in this case, are acute, right? None of them exceed 90. And this means that the deficit angle can be less than 180, okay? So in general, the deficit angle epsilon is going to be a function of the area. Okay, so now we're talking more in general now. So we've seen in the hyperbolic case that epsilon is going to be less than 180, and in the spherical case, epsilon is going to be greater than 180. And this is going to be a hallmark marker in telling us if we're on flat space or if we're, in, or if we're considering flat geometry or curved geometry. Different curve geometry yeah. in the general so so this is the formula we have now right so because and we're saying that in spherical geometry this k or this kappa right this is typically regarded as kappa all right kappa instead this kappa is uh, in spherical geometry going to be as what we see now is 1 over r squared uh, which is greater than 0 and in a hyperbolic geometry this is going to be smaller than 0. Since the area, so the area here has the units of length squared then it follows that in both spherical and hyperbolic geometry that k is going to have units of 1 over length squared. So this guy here is going to have units of one right. This is going to be essentially unitless, and this is going. Uh, we divide both sides by a. We get this one over length squared, and we're going to find later an interpretation for this in the case of hyperbolic geometry because you might think hyperbolas don't have a radius, right? That's kind of weird to think about, but we'll see how we'll see later well, how we can interpret this. And last but not least, again, this is a short video. This is a very soft introduction into uh, differential geometry. But if epsilon is zero, then the geometry is going to be flat. Right? This means that uh, kappa is one over r squared, which is equal to zero, which means that r must be large. Right? So if we go up here, up here, our deficit, if there's zero deficit, in the angle, that means epsilon is zero. If epsilon is zero, then, um, so if this is zero, then we have k times a, okay? So the only way for, if epsilon, if epsilon is zero, right? So that means this side of the equation is equal to zero, we get a, a is a constant, and we have k, which is also a constant. Oh, actually, k is 1 over r squared, right? I'll bring this down here, actually. Bring this down here. If that equals 0, well, you can either increase the area. Okay, that's a little bit uh, trivial. You, in you increase the area. You become uh, the, the space becomes more flat, or you can decrease the r the value for r. Or actually, no, you would actually have to increase the value of r for r, right? Because it's squared, and say one divided by a thousand squared, that's going to be very close to zero, right? So the radius in the spherical case has to be really large, and you could think about it if the radius is really large and you're standing at the pole, if the radius is really large, then you're going to be looking out at the pole thinking, oh, this is pretty much flat space. 
right? We live on the earth, the earth is a sphere, but when you sit it, when you're at the North Pole, the South Pole, everything pretty much looks flat, right? So at the approximation of R being really big, then we can say that this is roughly flat space, okay? So this is a soft introduction to uh, differential geometry. I'm going to be drawing from one book mainly, and that book is going to be this book right here, Visual Differential Geometry, okay, by Tristan Needham. Very good book. He has a good he has a book on complex analysis as well. But we are going a lot of sources on uh, YouTube already sort of go through uh, a complex analysis. It's more common. I, at least in my opinion, what I've seen on YouTube and other sources, to go over complex analysis than it is to go over differential geometry and forms. And so I thought this would be a good opportunity to make this a little bit more popular. And with that being said, I hope you like this kind of content. Make sure to hit that like and subscribe button. And make sure to hit up my Patreon page for exclusive content. And with that being said, I will see you guys in the next video.